Uh, thanks a lot, Jim, for these very uh, kind words. And I, it was really a fantastic experience having Jim in the classroom and questioning everything I said for three days. Uh, so uh, I learned a lot as well. Um, I love coming to the Daylighting Symposium here, and I can echo what uh, some of the previous speakers have said, that this is really the only event worldwide that I can think of where really the different groups that are working on Daylighting are coming together. So the, a lot of the professional uh, conferences, everybody gets uh, tagged in a box, right? So I'm in the Daylighting Geek modeling box, and then there are the uh, designers that show you pretty pictures and talk about uh, the daylit wall and how fabulous that is. And then we have the group of people that explain to us uh, the uh, benefits of light and health and so forth. But we need, of course, all three of us together, and we have to be in the same room, not only at the same conference. So I think this is an ideal event for this. And uh, I'm thankful to Vlux for inviting me again. Uh, I tend to think of my work not so much focused on daylight anymore, so every two years this gives me an opportunity to kind of look at our work under the lens of what, what we're doing has still something to do with daylighting. And really two topics emerged for me uh, this time uh, that we've been working on in our group substantially, and one is the obvious thing, if you want access on the urban level to daylight, getting either people outside and getting daylight inside, and I talk about some techniques of uh, how we can do that and accomplish that. So all this work is, of course, a big team effort. Everything, every paper in our group is we have several people working on this, uh, usually with a background in architecture, urban planning, computer science, and physicists. And the idea is, as uh, Jim said, we are developing planning tools, and we are trying to change current design practice by making better planning. Uh, by providing better decisions to decision makers. And really the bread and butter that we are using is building performance simulations. So we're doing a lot of modeling, like trying to understand the building or the city uh, early in the design process. And why are we actually doing that? So there are two main usage of building performance simulation. One is really you can think BRIAM or LEED for code compliance. That's for us the boring part, so we don't want to do that. The other one is really to compare different design variants. So we've seen this a million times, right? You want uh, the designer to come up with the idea, analyze the idea, say, hmm, uh, reassess the idea, and come up iteratively with better solutions. And then hopefully the simulations can help you quantify in how far your new design might be better than the previous one or not. So that seems very basic, but it doesn't happen very often. So this is a um, survey that we did a couple of years ago. And there we asked a couple of design firms, so how often do simulation results actually change your designs? Very basic. And of, we uh, split the results into two groups. We had one group of firms that are just commissioning consultants outside of their firm. And then we had the firms that have the consultancy inside. And obviously the result was that in the case when you do the LEED or BRIAM certification after the fact, in two thirds of the time it's too late, nothing. All the fruits of the simulations have no impact on the design itself. Uh, that's bad enough, but even the firms that hire uh, in-house their consultants, then a third of the time that really doesn't work. And that means it's not necessarily that there's bad will, but it's just very difficult to do that. And really a lot of our efforts in how do we make all these tools uh, and present results in a way that they actually can be digested and change something. So, and then of course we want to ask ourselves, where can we have the maximum impact? And we all know uh, we have this great historical uh, movement right now where we move from Homo sapiens to Homo urbanus. Everybody lives in cities. If you believe what the United Nations tell you, we will have to house 1.5 billion more city dwellers net more today in, um, in 15 years than we do today. And that really conveniently translates into 2 million new city dwellers every week. And if I just move that into my now home in Boston, we have half a million uh, inhabitants, 100,000 structures, so we basically have to build, if we were to replicate Boston, which I don't necessarily recommend, uh, 400,000 buildings a week, right? And if you, uh, earlier this year, when we uh, looked at the statistics, we had about 70,000 registered lead buildings. So that means in two days or so, all the efforts over the last 15 years are wiped out. So we need to introduce this notion of looking at cities and more urban scale modeling. So, and what kind of solution do we look at? These are kind of prototypes of uh, urban development, informal settlements, dense and cheap, um, suburban houses, high density, affordable. And then we have kind of the 
more uh, lush versions of retrofitting in Back Bay, Boston, where we take triple deckers and upgrade them. Or we have the plus energy home somewhere in Europe. So when we look at this and we just look at daylighting and we just look at energy, then we would say, well, obviously, everybody has to build a plus zero energy home, which is kind of ludicrous if you tell that to people in an informal settlement. So if we really want to have impact, we need multiple performance criteria. So we've been working for a couple of years on this urban modeling uh, interface called UMI. Uh, if you're into the Rhino world, you can download that from our website, where we look at multiple performance indicators from operational energy, mobility, comfort, to cost, embodied energy, and finally daylight. So I just wanted to highlight the daylight that I get invited again, so it's part of it. <laughs> but of course, the point that I want to make today, there are a lot of cross relationships going on as well. So coming back, two points. We had the urban scale, how do we get more daylight inside of buildings, and then I could talk about getting people outside. So when we want to do urban level daylighting analysis, what do we do there? We're really talking about the potential of a certain massing and to be able to have some daylight within the space. This is pre-talking about glare and light and health. This is really about the notion, do I get daylight to the street level or into the building, or have I come up with an urban setting where this doesn't work at all to begin with? So in order to do that, that's very tricky, right? Because if we use our established tools such as radiance, backward ray tracing, we basically start in a building, trace rays back, and we hope we find the sky. If we do that, that takes forever if you want to do that at the urban level. So we have an algorithm that we call urban daylight, where we basically break the uh, problem in two. We do a conventional calculation of radiation every hour of the facade, and we're combining that with what we call a light pulse. And when you do that, then effectively, we are assuming we're doing a potential analysis. So we are saying, OK, let's assume there are no interior walls. We just want to know in how far the building mass sinks, if there are no walls, can accommodate a lot of light in the space. And we assume as far as direct sunlight shines on it, it gets reflected or diffused by a shading system. And when we do this analysis, then effectively, we get these light pulses in the building. So the simulation is very fast. And we can end up with something like this. So our analysis and daylighting for daylight availability are always based on daylight autonomy. I'm actually a little stunned how many uh, of my speaker uh, peers this morning talked about daylight factor still. And I think that would be an interesting uh, panel discussion to be had at the VLOX symposium of why we're still stuck on the old continent in daylight factor use. So we're using annual calculations of how much daylight comes into a building. And obviously, that has certain advantages that have been widely uh, published. So when you do that, then you can do this kind of very quick analysis of whole neighborhoods and say how much light is available within a city. So once we had this tool, which was developed by Timo Dogan, who is now faculty of Cornell within our group, um, we want to learn something for this. And in order to learn it, we started with uh, zoning laws in Manhattan. So um, obviously, there's a certain conflict, right? If you want density, given the number of urban dwellers that we're going to have, we have to densify our cities. But at the same time, we want to keep the daylight. So we want to understand the relationship between these two variables. So uh, obviously, iconically, the zoning laws in um, New York have been in effect since 1916. And there are three main components. Uh, one is that we want uh, exposure on the street level. So the streets gets a certain amount of daylighting, which leads to the setbacks. Then you have the Rockefeller Center effect, where when the building gets high, it has to become narrower. And then if you uh, manage to create oops, a space uh, on the street level, you can build higher. So what this leads to is effectively something like oops, other way around. Something like this, where we say we have a certain density. If you're below that density, you ca it's daylight. Otherwise, it's not. And we want to see if that's really true. So in order to do that, we started this massive simulation study where we came up with five different urban archetypes. And we increased their density from a floor area ratio of 2 to 30, which is really massively dense. And when we look at these different archetypes, you actually see everything that's here shown in magenta is not allowed in New York. So you can only build whatever is on the left. But when we do actually annual urban performance in cities built like this, we actually see that some of the, uh, the urban typologies perform very well. So when you take that in another graph, then here you see density again. And you see on the top for different archetypes how often do they meet 
the urban lead criteria. And then you basically see that some typologies are really pitiful, but some, especially this kind of t uh, stencil tower approaches that you see popping up in Manhattan right now, you can actually build extremely high. So this uh, variant here can have a floor area ratio of 25, which is enormous. And if you would translate that into real estate value within New York, you can basically per block then support 100,000 more square meter, which would cost in New York today about a billion dollar of real estate value. So the values are just massive that you create in this kind of performance-based approach towards daylighting. So we covered the first part. Now I want to talk a bit about our work towards how do we get people outside. And that's very, very tricky. So just the understanding. I'm talking really from, a, uh, from understanding how people uh, behave in cities. So the first component was really that we want to know when people actually want to leave one building and go to another building. So this is work, there's a lot of this going on at MIT right now. This is work with Martha Gonzalez from Civil Engineering, where we use this at, uh, transportation surveys, and basically we cluster the whole population of Boston into four different types. We have the stay-home person, we have the worker, we have the student, and we have an adventurer that has more erratic behavior. And everybody wants to be the adventurer. I'm actually a student, it's a little depressing, but uh, I guess when you have kids, that's the more natural uh, patterns that you follow. But once you have this, you can basically predict when people are going to uh, leave their building and where they might be going. So then the next step is that we want to see relationships. This is just some quick graphs from our bike sharing program. So similar to what you have in London, do you see here? So Bostonians only bike when the temperature is really benign and when it doesn't rain. I guess in London there is a little more tolerance for rain than in our case, but if you have a, a, a pure bike sharing mode or when you have the choice between taking the bike or not, you clearly see this relationship here. So, and that we can of course combine with a lot of work that's go currently going on in terms of outdoor thermal comfort. So how do we really uh, crack this nut, right, that we can protect in any urban setting, how comfortable people are going to be in outdoor spaces. So one of the key things that we concentrated on is the mean radiant temperature field. So we know it's wind, nobody can do that. Uh, there is dry bulb temperature, relative humidity, and just the, uh, the temperature of the surrounding surfaces. So in order to uh, calculate that, here you see an example, this is Copley Square in Boston. We use um, a CAT model of the environment, we then uh, break up every surface in our CAT model and calculate for every hour of the year the outside temperature of these surfaces. Then we use uh, radians to collect um, the form factors of all the surfaces around us. But what that gives you in the end is basically this distribution as what you see here, where we can exactly say what's the perceived temperature every hour of the year within these spaces. There are effects such as trees that we don't really handle right now. They're only straighting objects, but that's really where we want to go. And if I now start to combine these two things, then we want to be here. So we know that somebody is at this part of the city and wants to go somewhere. Then we can look at different routes, and depending on the thermal comfort along the route, we can say what's the most probable way that people are going to take. How long is it going to take them? Are they going to bike, to walk, take the bus, or the car? So with that, we really want to look at, apart from the interior daylighting potential, at really the opportunity for people to go somewhere, and then they're outside, right? People are not just going to go outside because it's healthy. That's, I guess, not part of our uh, hectic lifestyle. But if walking is the best way for us to get somewhere, we're probably going to do it. So that leads me then, so these were two topics really related to, to daylighting. But when we try to evaluate cities, and I said earlier, we want to have an impact, right? So this is a graph that I already showed last time. I always, when I come back, have to check that I don't show a slide twice. So this is a, a, an old slide. So we used to look at a neighborhood and say, OK, what's your floor air ratio, cost, um, energy use, daylighting, and so forth. What we do now, this is kind of iteration two, is that we create this JavaScript-based environments. You can test that on our website where we automatically, out of the urban planning tool, we create the standalone applications. So if you're on the design team for urban planning, you're creating this file that can be read in here, and you can share this with your client. And this is very important because once we're at the urban level, you deal with non-experts, right? So you basically have to quickly take your simulation results and make them digestible. 
So in this case, for example, you directly create here this mini campus with a few buildings. And when you click interactively on any of them, you see the performance of each building for life cycle, for daylighting, and so forth. So you have a sharing platform that allows you basically to uh, talk to your various stakeholders and say, this is how my urban proposal is going to work. So then, unfortunately, people still are not going to trust us, right? So how do we get people to convince, how do we convince all stakeholders at a city council meeting that actually what we are proposing here is the right proposal? And really, that leads to the effect that, of course, when it comes to cities, everybody has a preconceived notion, an idea of what the city should be. And so we really want to collectively gather everybody's input. In order to do this, we worked with the MIT Media Lab and in uh, Riyadh with the Center for Complex Engineering Systems, and we bought, uh, built this Lego table. And what this Lego table does effectively, we uh, tested that with the planning board in Riyadh. There's a screen of a neighborhood that's under development, and here you see the planning board in Riyadh sit with our Lego table, and you have a 1.2 by 1.2 square kilometer of area in the city, you have 16 different pieces. It could be a park, residential building, mixed use. And while you're placing these Lego pieces on there, we have a real-time simulation for daylighting, for energy, and for walkability. And we basically have people explore um, different urban typologies and ideas. Uh, so here. And that was really highly successful. We had uh, 20 members of the planning board there, always groups of four. They worked for half an hour on this together and was just a very engaging process overall. So I see this type of real-time simulations being um, a complement to the more detailed simulations that we're running as well. So this really brings me towards the end. So some closing thoughts. Uh, I think urban level analysis is really where for us daylighting is going right now. Uh, at that point, we cannot just look at daylight availability or glare, but we really have to combine this analysis with different uh, urban sustainable metrics uh, aspects. Uh, when it comes to the daylighting performance in terms of daylight zoning, with this one study in Manhattan, we already showed that you can actually have huge creative freedom here, right? So the vision for us is that depending on where you are and within the world, zoning boards uh, have a consultancy firm come up with good target levels and say you can either work within this framework or you can use the simulation tools yourself and create good solutions, you just have to meet certain target levels. That's, of course, going to unleash a lot of des creative design activity, especially if you think of the value that you're creating if you manage to build up higher FARs than you would otherwise be allowed. And uh, finally, this uh, notion of getting people outside is really as much of urban design as getting daylight into the building. We are really at the beginning there, but a lot of people are working right now on trying to understand what people do Usually this type of research tries to understand where you shop so that you get more detailed shopping advertisements, but at the same time we can use this work also for more benign applications such as this one. Thank you.